Something 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 Mongol invasion. Come on, do I really need to sell you on this one? It's the freaking Mongol invasion, man. You know you're sticking around regardless of what I say in this intro. Plus, once all that's wrapped up, we get to bear witness to the epically disastrous downfall of the Kamakura Shogunate, complete with all the coup d'etats, shady schemes, and grand betrayals you've come to expect out of Japan's ever-eventful historical saga. Trust me folks, this is a doubleheader you're not gonna wanna miss as we wave goodbye to the Kamakura period on this 14th episode of Japanese History the Textbook, right here on the Buyuden Japanese History Channel. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Japanese History the Textbook, the series where we make our way chronologically through the history of Japan, using Japanese language educational materials as our primary guide. As usual, if you'd like to see the names of the textbooks and other educational sources that form the backbone of this series, as well as the supplemental sources that I bring in to flesh out the narrative, you can find those down in the video description below. Once again, I'd like to thank all of you who have subscribed to the channel, as well as watched, commented on, and liked my videos. We have now passed the 4,000 subscriber mark, and five of the channel's videos have been viewed over 10,000 times, which is honestly just really, really awesome, so thank you. I'm excited to see how much we can grow in 2023, and I hope I can count on your continued viewership as we head into the new year. Anyway, as mentioned in the intro, today's episode will be our final look at the Kamakura period, widely regarded as Japan's first fully medieval phase of history. So I think perhaps it's worth taking a moment to briefly sum up what's happened in the period so far. In episode 12, we saw the warrior nobleman Minamoto no Yoritomo receive the title of Shogun and establish Japan's first shogunate, or Bakufu, in Japanese, an organization which we often describe as a samurai government in hindsight, but which at its outset was really just an organization formed to manage Yoritomo's household affairs, as well as the large number of lower-ranking warriors who had come to serve him. For these warriors, whom we call Gokenin, Yoritomo became a sort of supreme godfather, using his political influence to officially guarantee and even boost their hereditary land rights and local authority, in exchange for their personal allegiance. In the early years of the 1200s, after Yoritomo's death, his direct line of descendants quickly fizzled out thanks to shady dealings and assassinations, and the leadership of the Bakufu gradually came to be spearheaded by the Hojo a warrior family of relatively average status who happened to have had the good fortune of becoming the late Yoritomo's in-laws. With the extinction of the Minamoto shoguns, Japan's imperial court, led by its retired emperor, attempted to eliminate the Hojo and reassert its authority over the warriors of eastern Japan. But said warriors largely chose to instead side with the Hojo, and a very brief civil war ensued. The Bakufu won this war, and in doing so established themselves as a powerful presence which wasn't going anywhere anytime soon, and whose cooperation and, in some cases, even permission would hereafter be required for the imperial court to continue governing the country. In the following decades, the Bakufu leadership, helmed of course by the Hojo, consistently worked to flesh out the Bakufu as an institution responsible for managing the country's warriors, using an organized written law code and adding various new offices and departments to aid in their day-to-day -day affairs. These decades also saw the main line of the Hojo gradually establish themselves as a sort of pseudo-royal family within the context of the Bakufu. And by the 1260s, the Kamakura shoguns were little more than puppets, and the Bakufu's de facto leadership position of Shikken or shogunal regent was the undisputed property of the Hojo main line. It was in this era, this golden age of Hojo rule, that we finished off our previous video, with the Bakufu leaders having just had their gaze forcibly redirected to the outside world with the arrival of an ominous letter from the ruler of the Mongol Empire. How will they respond to this letter? Well, let's jump in and take a look, beginning with a little background on the circumstances from which the Mongol Empire itself emerged. Japanese History the Textbook, Episode 14 the Kamakura Period, Part 3 From the 10th century onward, the nomadic tribes of the northern part of the Asian continent had begun to show an unprecedented flurry of activity, 
characterized by the successive emergence of the Liao dynasty of the Khitan people, the Jin dynasty of the Jurchen people, and finally the eponymous Mongol Empire of the Mongols. The first of these, the Liao dynasty, was destroyed and supplanted by the second, the Jin dynasty, in 1125, and the Jin went on to move south and annex the capital of the Chinese Song Empire, Kaifeng. The Song retreated south and established a new capital at the city of Lin'an, beginning a new era in continental Asian politics and the latter phase of their dynasty's history, the self-explanatorily titled Southern Song Period. As we've discussed in previous videos, wealthy Japanese carried out a great deal of private trade with Song China during this period, leading to a large influx of Song coinage and the beginnings of a currency economy utilizing this coinage on the Japanese archipelago. In 1206, after years of conflict, a man by the name of Temujin managed to unite the tribes of the Mongol steppe and became appointed Khan or ruler of said tribes, taking on a name which even the most history illiterate of folks is sure to have heard at least once, Genghis Khan, or Chinggis Khan if you're going for what is apparently a slightly more accurate pronunciation. In the following decades, the Mongols expanded their sphere of influence rapidly and constructed an empire that spanned across Central Asia from northern India to southern Russia. In the east, they destroyed the Jurchen Jin and began to advance into the Korean peninsula, and in the west, they waged war as far afield as Central Europe. Genghis Khan's grandson and fifth-generation successor, Kublai Khan, constructed the city of Dadu at what is modern Beijing, and he designated it the new capital of the Mongol Empire in 1271, simultaneously declaring the empire's official name to be Great Yuan and reimagining it as a Chinese-style empire. One of Kublai's most pressing goals was the subjugation of the remainder of the Song Empire, and in pursuit of this goal, he also began chipping away at the kingdoms with whom the Song regularly traded, places such as Cambodia, Myanmar, and, most relevant for us, Japan. In 1268, Kublai sent correspondence to Japan strongly urging the Japanese to become a tributary state of the Mongol Empire, this of course being the message we encountered at the end of our last episode. But the retired emperor's council opted not to send a reply, and the Kamakura Bakufu followed suit by urging the warriors of western Japan to be vigilant in anticipation of a possible Mongol threat. The following year, an irritated Kublai sent a second message to the Japanese, and this time the increasingly nervous imperial court actually drafted a reply, albeit a politely negative one. But the Bakufu stepped in and vetoed this. Japan would have no words for the Mongol emperor. The de facto leader of the Kamakura Bakufu at this time was the 18-year-old Hojo Tokimune, who had only just ascended to the position of Shikken or Shogunal Regent the previous year. Tokimune was the son of the late Hojo Tokiyori, the man often credited with perfecting and finalizing the Kamakura Bakufu's Shikken-led system of government, and he was the first Shikken to truly be born into the purple in the sense that his path to leadership had been promised from birth. While he was undeniably extremely young for the job, he had been interning, if you will, in the Bakufu's administration since the age of 14 as the Rensho, or co-signer to the previous Shikken, his great-great-uncle Hojo Masamura. And when Tokimune turned 18, he and the 62-year-old Masamura switched jobs so that the much older man could continue on as his advisor and right-hand man. Tokimune and the Bakufu would receive a final messenger from the Mongols in 1271, but yet again they chose the path of silence, giving the messenger no reply, and instead ordering any eastern Gokenin warriors possessing land in Kyushu to make their way down there and prepare to defend their southern territory from foreign invaders. In 1274, Kublai at last pulled the trigger and launched an invasion of the Japanese archipelago, with an army consisting of about 20,000 Mongolians and 10,000 Koreans. The force brutalized the islands of Tsushima and Iki and marauded along the coast of Bizen province before finally attempting a full-fledged landfall at Hakata Bay, where Bakufu forces were awaiting them. The Gokenin warriors struggled greatly against the Mongols' organized fighting style and advanced weaponry, which even included an early type of hand grenade, and they were forced to retreat back to the Dazaifu and allow the Mongol army to temporarily occupy Hakata, where they famously burned the Hakozaki Hachimangu shrine. When night fell, however, the Mongols made the surprising move of pulling back to their ships, and the following day they abandoned Japan's waters entirely and returned to Korea, ending the first Mongol invasion of Japan, referred to in Japanese as the Bunge no Eki, or the War of the Bunge Era. The departure of the Mongol ships is rumored to have been the result of a violent storm which ravaged their fleet in the hours after the battle, 
the first instance of the kamikaze, or divine wind, for which the Mongol invasions are so famous. But scholarly opinion is split on whether this storm was actually a deciding factor in the conflict, or indeed if it even happened at all. Regardless, it is likely that the main reason for the Mongols' early retreat is that this initial invasion had been planned not for conquest, but for the purposes of reconnaissance and intimidation, although, as we are about to see, they definitely did not find much success with the latter. Either way, Kublai had by no means given up on Japan, and in 1275 he sent yet another embassy to the country to see if they had learned their lesson, but the stubborn Hojo Tokimune decided to give him a big, fat, proverbial middle finger and have these messengers beheaded in Kamakura. Following this, the Bakufu began preparing for the now very high possibility of a second invasion, establishing a rotational guard duty system in Kyushu called the Ikoku Keigo Banyaku the Foreign Defense Service rotation, and building a series of earth and stone walls along the coast of Hakata Bay. Walls, by the way, which have partially survived to the present day. The Bakufu even considered a brash plan to launch a counter-invasion against the Mongols, but fortunately for them, considering that there is no way such an endeavor would have ended happily, this never made it past the planning stages. As part of all their wartime preparations, the Bakufu took advantage of the emergency circumstances to give themselves the legal authority to mobilize not only their direct subordinates, the Gokenin warriors, but also all of the other bushi of western Japan, the ones who were not affiliated with the Bakufu, but rather had been directly serving Shouen estate proprietors. These non-Bakufu warriors would hereafter be placed under the jurisdiction of their regional shugo, and the tax rice generated by the lands that they managed would now be subject for requisitioning as food for Kyushu's defenders. As we have seen time and time again in history, times of crisis provided the governing class with a convenient opportunity to slide their tendrils into the avenues of society which they had heretofore been unable to penetrate. In 1279, Kublai finally succeeded in destroying the Song dynasty and uniting China under Mongol rule and with the burden this took off his shoulders, he turned his attention back to the insolent little island nation to his east. The army he mustered for the second invasion of Japan is said to have been a massive 140,000 men, much larger than the first force he had sent, and for the purpose of travel it was split into two main contingents, the Toro army and the Konan army. The former army was the smaller of the two, at about 40,000, and once again it was made up of a combination of Mongols and Koreans, and the latter was the greater force, about 100,000 strong, and it was made up of soldiers from the newly conquered former denizens of Song China. As you can gather from this breakdown, the quote-unquote Mongol army mobilized for this legendary conflict only included a small minority of the feared Mongol warriors who had taken Asia by storm a few generations earlier. Kublai commenced his second invasion in 1281, with the plan being for his two armies to depart from different locations within the Mongol Empire, and then rendezvous at the island of Iki before making a combined assault on Hakata Bay with their full strength. This time, many of the army's vessels were laden with farming equipment such as hoes and plows, indicating that long-term occupation was very much the end goal of this new campaign. However, the Mongol plans were quickly thrown off track when the smaller army, the Toro army, departed on schedule in late May, but the larger Chinese contingent, the Konan army, experienced a delay of roughly a month and a half thanks to their commander suddenly taking ill. The Toro army attempted to make landfall in Japan unsupported, but the warriors of Kyushu, aided by their new coastal defense embankments and the wisdom of experience, forced the Mongol soldiers to retreat before actually managing to secure a foothold in Hakata Bay. The Konan army would finally make it out to sea in early July, and by early August they had linked up with the battered Toro army and relocated to an island called Takashima off of Kyushu's coast to begin preparing for a full-strength second attack on the Hakata area. However, on the night of August 15th by the Julian calendar, they were, drum roll please, hit by a massive summer typhoon, this being the second and more convincing event which was instrumental in birthing the kamikaze legend. The Mongol fleet was devastated by the storm, and the opportunistic Japanese warriors seized the chance to kick the Mongols while they were down the next day by launching little attack boats to harass the survivors, and ultimately it is said that only about 10-20% to of the great Mongol army managed to make it back to mainland Asia. The tenacious Kublai was not one to give up on account of a single bad defeat, and he began laying plans for a third invasion of Japan. But thankfully for the Japanese, domestic unrest and rebellion within the Mongol Empire would prevent these plans from ever seeing fruition. 
The Kamakura Bakufu, however, would find itself busy with its own set of domestic problems without having to worry about another Mongol invasion. The most serious of these being the matter of the rewards, or rather lack thereof, that it owed to its subjects. As we discussed in our first episode on this period, the Bakufu was founded on the reciprocal relationship between the Shogun and the Gokinian, the exchange of Goon and Hoko, aka rewards and service. In a conflict like the Jokyu War, the Gokinian had rendered a service for the Bakufu by marching out to battle to defend it, or well technically to defend the Hojo, and the Bakufu had then rewarded them with the land it had seized from that war's losers. However, with the Mongol invasions, there was no land to seize from anyone. The enemy had been a foreign power, and driving them off had only succeeded in protecting what Japan already had, rather than securing anything new for Japan's warriors. Indeed, this was probably part of the reason that the Bakufu considered the reckless idea of taking the fight to the Mongols, an idea that was apparently considered yet again after the end of the second invasion. It certainly didn't help that the warriors who participated in the defense against the Mongols did so largely at their own expense, bringing their own horses, armor, weapons, and followers, meaning that many of them came out of the conflict having suffered a net financial loss. Lack of reward from the Bakufu, however, was not the only problem weighing heavy on Japan's rank and file bushi during the late Kamakura period. But to understand the other troubles facing them, we need to take a step back and examine the changes society was undergoing during these years. The 13th century was a period of important agricultural advancement for the people of Japan, with earlier centuries' emphasis on opening up new land for farming being replaced by an emphasis on improving agricultural efficiency in pre-existing fields. There were advances in fertilizer technology and the technique of double cropping, or nimosaku in Japanese, in which both rice and wheat were alternatingly cultivated in the same field, saw a boom in popularity thanks to bakufu encouragement. In addition, beasts of burden such as cattle and horses and new irrigation technology such as the water wheel came to be widely used in the cultivation process, making it easier for farmers to carry out a large volume of work in a shorter amount of time. All of these steps forward slowly contributed to an increase in spare wealth for, and thus consequently, a rise in the power and independence of, the common farming class and we begin to see the first examples of peasants themselves attempting to assert themselves against the more traditionally powerful elements of society. This change is most famously represented by a petition written in 1275 by the peasants of the Ategawa Shouen of Ki province, addressed to that Shouen's owner and bemoaning the conduct of the Shouen's bakufu appointed Jito. The peasants describe how they have been unable to pay their taxes because the Jito keeps pulling them away from their rightful jobs to perform private labor for him, labor that he forces them into by threatening that he will, quote, slice off the ears and shave off the noses of their wives and children. The entire petition fills a scroll that is roughly two meters in length and is written entirely in shaky, unconfident katakana that would almost look adorable if it weren't for the serious nature of its content. While the peasants of the Kamakura period were not yet at the level of resisting the leadership classes of society with the brute force that we will see them use in later centuries, they were undeniably beginning to stand up for themselves, a phenomenon which speaks to the growing sense of unity that the era's changes were nurturing within medieval Japanese villages. Beyond these tighter-knit and more assertive peasant communities, the various advances in farming technology also provided for the emergence of full-time specialists in various crafts, such as blacksmithing, casting, and woodworking. And the natural result of this was that there were suddenly a lot more products, both agricultural and otherwise, being circulated around the country. These products were primarily traded at local marketplaces, called ichi in Japanese, which had been appearing around regional traffic hubs sporadically since the end of the Heian period. But with the new boom in production, these marketplaces started to become regular events consistently held several times a month on fixed dates. In order to facilitate this growing commercial activity, coinage quickly came to play a crucial role in economic activity, specifically the aforementioned coins minted in Song China that had been gradually getting imported into Japan for the last century or so. Now, as we discussed long, long ago in this series, Japan's imperial court had been officially minting native coinage from time to time since the tail end of the Asuka period, but a total lack of understanding of basic economics among the country's top aristocracy had led to these coins' value fluctuating violently over the decades and centuries, and failing to ever garner much trust or enthusiasm from the general public. 
The song currency, however, held its value much more reliably, and throughout the 13th century, spurred by the sudden growth in economic activity around the country, it gradually came to be used as the primary means for carrying out monetary transactions. As an example, in the early Kamakura period, roughly 60% of all land sales were paid for in rice, with about 40% being paid for in coinage. But by the end of the period, those statistics had more than flipped, with coins now funding 85% of all land transactions. Moreover, it is apparently not uncommon for archaeological digs at medieval Japanese historical sites to uncover troves of song coinage in the neighborhood of hundreds of thousands of coins. Where there is money, it also naturally follows that there will be people who make it their profession to handle said money, and it is no coincidence that the Kamakura period saw the emergence of wealthy professional moneylenders called kashiage, wholesale merchants called toimaru, and a new system called kawashi, which allowed for large cash payments to be completed safely over long distances using paper checks. This is where we come full circle back to the problems of the Kamakura Gokenin warriors, for you see, they were not adapting well to the new coinage-based economy. Most Gokenin were provincial land managers whose primary income was the rice grown on their lands, rice which fluctuated in both value and quantity depending upon the seasons. When expenses arose during the pre-harvest time of the year when rice was scarce, many Gokinin began opting to utilize the services of the new Kashiage moneylenders, whom they would borrow money from using their land and possessions as collateral. As for why the Gokinin were so poor that they needed to borrow money in the first place, well, the Kamakura period inheritance system practiced by most Bushi warriors was a major culprit. As we discussed last episode, the warriors of this era generally divided their inheritance up amongst their children, rather than giving it all to a single heir, meaning that over the course of several generations, individual warriors were coming to hold smaller and smaller plots of land. Less land meant less income, but the Bakufu still expected them to perform their duties as Gokenin, such as their extended self-funded periods of guard duty in Kyoto, Kamakura, and now Kyushu. The Mongol invasion had come right in the midst of this period of increasingly tough economic circumstances, and, as we saw, it was a net financial negative for most of its participants. Anyway, all these factors combined to drive the Gokenin right into the hungry maws of the Kashiage moneylenders, and many of them were too poor and or inexperienced with the idea of a currency economy to ever be able to get back out, defaulting on their loans and losing what remained of their ancestral land completely. The Kamakura Bakufu took this problem very seriously, as penniless Gokenin were incapable of rendering service to the Bakufu and the Shogun, and in the latter decades of the 1200s, they issued a number of legal decrees attempting to rectify the problem. The most famous of these is 1297's Einin no Tokusere, roughly translatable into English as the Benevolent Decree of the Einin Era. This decree is best known for its second article, which banned Gokenin from either selling their land or using it as collateral for loans, and it went even further by brazenly declaring that any land previously acquired from a Gokenin warrior through such a transaction was to be returned to its original owner free of charge. As you can probably imagine, this decree was problematic for all kinds of reasons, being a massive slap in the face to anyone who had ever done business with a Gokenin, and simultaneously depriving said Gokenin of their only reliable means of generating fast cash. Several aspects of the decree, including the ban on the selling and pawning of land, were repealed the following year, but it left a great number of people, including those both inside and outside the Bakufu system, feeling very dissatisfied with Bakufu policy and leadership. With this growing poverty and the mounting difficulty of existing within the Bakufu's traditional lord-vassal system, some warriors began to drop out entirely, instead forming marauding nomadic bands and supporting themselves by raiding Shoen estates or getting themselves a piece of the pie in the burgeoning world of commercial trade. These warriors, who scorned the laws of the land and the societal roles expected of their class, were broadly referred to as Akto, a word which means something like scoundrel or villain in modern Japanese, but seems to have simply meant something closer to outlaw at the time. The emergence of these Akto bands proved to be a great thorn in the side of the Bakufu and the establishment elite, and their existence was yet another symptom of the growing dissatisfaction within society regarding the way the Hojo were running the country. So, how were the Hojo running the country in Japan's post-Mongol invasion world? Well, for one, many of the policies conceived during the invasion years were continued in the aftermath, because, after all, 
no one at the time had any way of knowing that the Mongols wouldn't launch any subsequent attacks on Japan. The policy of making Gokenin warriors take turns serving guard duty in Kyushu in the Foreign Defense Service rotation was continued, and the Bakufu established a new office on the island called the Chinze Tandai for the supervision and legal arbitration of the warriors of southwestern Japan. This position was very similar to the Bakufu's supervisory office in Kyoto, the Rokuhara Tandai, and like that office it was entrusted only to members of the greater Hojo clan. This trend toward placing more and more authority into the hands of direct Hojo affiliates is probably the most defining feature of the Bakufu in the late Kamakura period, and it is for this reason that this phase of history is often described as the era of Hojo despotism. The trend had begun to emerge even before the Mongol invasions with Hojo Tokiyori, who took to occasionally bypassing the Hyojoshu council on matters of great political import and instead discussing them at his private residence with family members and close personal confidants. This way of doing things became even more frequent and pronounced under Tokimune, who made various major policy decisions regarding the Mongol invasion in a similar manner. Moreover, the Hyojoshu and the Hikitsukeshu gradually came to be dominated by a majority of Hojo relatives, meaning that even when matters of policy were discussed in the Bakufu's official organs of government, the conclusions reached were likely to be right in line with whatever the Hojo patriarch's opinion was. During the chaos of the Mongol invasions, a number of personnel changes were made in the Shugo appointments to Japan's southwestern provinces in the name of better responding to the foreign threat and these too were filled with members of the extended Hojo family. Indeed, by the end of the Kamakura period, the greater Hojo clan held the Shugo positions of more than 30 of the country's 68 provinces, roughly half of the country, in other words. With the establishment of the Hojo's undisputed supremacy over the Kamakura Bakufu, and by extension the country, a powerful new faction began to emerge to throw its weight around in the political sphere, the Miyuchibito. Miyuchibito literally translates to something along the lines of person of the family or our own people, and in the context of the Kamakura Bakufu, it refers to the individuals who entered into lord vassal relationships not with the shogun but directly with the hojo. Given that the hojo had now sunk their talons into every last aspect of the Bakufu organization and had become its quote unquote royal family in all but name, the personal retainers of the clan enjoyed an unprecedented level of power and prestige, despite being of relatively low status on paper. The power of the Miyuchibito was put on full display in 1284, just a few years after the end of the Mongol invasion, when the young Shikken Tokimune passed away of disease at the age of only 33. Tokimune's 12-year-old son Satatoki was selected to succeed him as Shikken, but the real power behind the office came to be the subject of a tug-of-war match between two of the Bakufu's older members, Taira no Yoritsuna and Adachi Asumori. The former, Taira no Yoritsuna, was the highest-ranking member of the aforementioned Miyuchibito, serving as the mainline Hojo family's household steward, and also being the husband to the former wet nurse of the new Shikken Satatoki. The latter, Adachi Asumori, was the most powerful non-Hojo Gokenin still on the political scene, although he was still very Hojo adjacent considering that the two families had been intermarrying for generations and Yasumori himself was the blood uncle and legal maternal grandfather of Satatoki. Yasumori had been the political right hand of the late Tokimune, and he initially assumed de facto leadership of the Bakufu in the wake of his death pushing through a series of reforms whose myriad of goals included things such as clearing up the increasingly blurry boundaries between the Hojo family and the Kamakura Bakufu itself, and properly rewarding and issuing Gokenin status to the non-Gokenin warriors of southwestern Japan who had fought during the Mongol invasions. The Miyuchibito and their leader Yoritsuna, however, were not fond of the outsider Yasumori's grip on power, nor of his reforms which threatened to reduce their significance in the political world. In 1285, the tension at last erupted into violence, with the Miyuchibito faction attacking Yasumori and his supporters in the middle of Kamakura, and the massive and chaotic street battle eventually claiming the lives of Yasumori and about 500 other high-ranking Gokenin, including many of the other key members of the Adachi family. This incident, which triggered similar anti-Adachi purges in other parts of the country, and was arguably the Bakufu's most vicious internal conflict of the Kamakura period, is remembered as the Shimotsuki incident, with Shimotsuki meaning frost month and referring to the winter month in which the conflict occurred. 
Personally, I like to use an alternate translation of the kanji characters and call it the Frost Moon Incident, because even though it deliberately mistranslates the actual meaning of the original Japanese, I just think it sounds really badass. Anyway, Taira no Yoritsuna would exert his despotic will over the Bakufu and the country for the next eight years, staffing the Hyojoshu and the Hikitsukeshu with his supporters, overturning Yasumori's policies, and generally ensuring that power and wealth continued to be concentrated in the hands of the Hojo and, by extension, himself. He also, ironically, used the land he had confiscated from the various slaughtered Adachi family members to finally begin giving some significant territorial rewards to the veterans from the fight against the Mongols. Sadly for Yoritsuna though, his dictatorial reign was never destined to last long, as he was ultimately killed at the orders of his own patron, the Shikken Hojo Saratoki, when the latter had finally aged into adulthood and decided that he didn't appreciate his household steward trying to fulfill his hereditary duties. Still, the entire affair had shown just how far the balance of power had shifted within the Bakufu, in that a lowly Hojo retainer, in other words, the vassal of a vassal from the Shogun's perspective, had spent the better part of a decade running the whole affair. The final few decades of the Kamakura period saw a Bakufu which had unequivocally morphed into the personal property of the Hojo, helmed by their mainline patriarch and staffed mostly with relatives and Miyuchibito retainers, the latter of which now included recruits from a variety of Gokenin families who had decided that pledging their service directly to the Hojo was the best way to stay afloat in the world. The Hojo seemed to be living out their golden age as the undisputed masters of the country, but however grand the house that Tokimasa had built may have appeared on the surface, corruption and nepotism were seriously beginning to rot its foundations, and in reality it had become brittle enough that a robust push from an outside force could bring the whole building crashing down. That push would come from a place that the Bakufu leaders had long considered to be a neutralized threat which they had had safely in their pocket for just about a century now the imperial court. You will recall that, in the aftermath of the Jokyu War in 1221, the Bakufu had spearheaded a massive reorganization of the imperial court's leadership, exiling a trio of influential retired emperors and putting a new branch of the imperial family in charge of court affairs. Well, that episode had set the precedent for the Bakufu to be a key player in deciding who sat on the Chrysanthemum throne from that point onwards, and they continued meddling in the succession throughout the remainder of the 1200s and into the next century. Over the course of that meddling, although by no means caused directly by it, the imperial line had actually split into a pair of factions descended from two different emperors, the brothers Gofukakusa and Kameyama, who had both reigned in the mid-1200s and had both wanted to see their progeny inherit the throne. Rather than siding with a single faction, the Bakufu had actually encouraged the two groups to take turns providing emperors and running court affairs in a system we referred to as Ryoto Tetsuritsu, or the alternating succession. This was the system by which the imperial court was uneasily operating in the year 1318, when the 31-year-old Emperor Godaigo came to the throne as the next representative of the Kameyama line, which was at that time being led by his retired father. Godaigo was never intended to be anything other than another bit player in the soap opera drama of the alternating succession, but unfortunately for the leaders of both imperial factions, Godaigo was not really cut out to be just another puppet ruler. He was a bold and energetic young man with a passion for politics and a deep interest in Neo-Confucianism and strong Chinese-style government, and he deeply idolized the past eras of Japanese history before Fujiwaras and retired imperial dads and backcountry ruffians from Kanto had showed up to steal power away from the emperor. As soon as Godaigo got on the throne, he began actively searching for a way to stay there, a goal which he soon concluded could only be realized by dismantling the system of alternating succession and the organization which had spent the last several decades supporting it, the Kamakura Bakufu. When the leader of the Kameyama faction, Godaigo's father, died in 1324, the newly independent emperor sprang into action and began recruiting disgruntled monks and warriors to his cause, hosting secret strategy meetings which were disguised as wild and debauched drinking parties. Godaigo's plan was to use the chaos of a festival day to stage an attack on one of the Rokuhara Tandai, the Bakufu's chief representatives in the capital, but the plan ultimately leaked before it could be carried out, and the Bakufu harshly dealt with all of the plan's participants, with the exception of the emperor himself. 
This unsuccessful coup, which saw two of Godaigo's closest advisors sent into exile, is remembered to history as the Shochu Incident, a name which, for the record, has nothing to do with the similarly named alcoholic beverage, despite what one might assume based on the aforementioned drinking parties. The headstrong Godaigo, however, was not one to be deterred by failure, and within a few years he was already formulating another plan to topple the Hojo making diplomatic visits to the great temples and shrines around Kyoto and Nara to build friendships and holding secret prayer rituals with his advisors, calling on the gods to destroy the Bakufu. At the end of 1331, however, the emperor's plans yet again leaked to his enemies, and this time the Bakufu was not so lenient in their response, going so far as to execute two of his closest aristocratic confidants. Even in the midst of these very serious events, however, the Bakufu hardly seemed to have its full focus on the situation, as it was embroiled in its own internal power struggle for de facto control of the organization in the absence of any strong leadership from the Hojo patriarch of the time, Hojo Takatoki. The literature of later generations paints Takatoki as an incompetent degenerate who idly absorbed himself in enjoying dogfights and Dengaku dance performances while the organization his forefathers had built crumbled around him. And although such literary depictions must always be taken with a grain of salt, it is hard to deny that he was not the unifying force that the Bakufu could have used at the time. With the discovery of his plan and the arrest of his advisors, a frantic Godaigo gathered up the imperial treasures and fled to Mount Kasagi, south of Kyoto, where he raised a small number of troops and attempted to hole up in the treacherous mountain terrain. However, the Bakufu dispatched a large army of its warriors and surrounded the mountain, and despite the defenders' best efforts, they were overwhelmed by the much greater force and the emperor was taken into Bakufu custody. In the aftermath of the incident, remembered to history as the Genko Incident, the Bakufu decided that they had had just about as much as they could take from this troublemaking emperor, and following the precedent established a hundred years prior in the Jokyu War, they forced Godaigo to abdicate the throne and exiled him to the remote island of Oki. For a moment, it almost seemed as if Godaigo's plans had been foiled for good, but in a surprising turn of events, his defiant stand against the Bakufu had created ripples that were now radiating throughout the country. The Japan of the early 14th century was a far different place than it had been the first time the Bakufu had dethroned an emperor, and the country was now full of people who were sick and tired of Hojo tyranny, and a Bakufu which had failed to help its core constituents as they had slowly slid into poverty and ruin. A month after Godaigo's exile, a roguish samurai named Kusunoki Masashige, who had actually supported the deposed emperor in his failed stand at Mount Kasagi, raised troops and began openly carrying out anti-Bakufu military movements. Masashige's background remains a bit murky even today, but he does seem to have originally been a vassal of the Bakufu, who also misbehaved enough to be labeled by contemporaries as an akto, the word for anti-establishment outlaws that we discussed earlier. Perhaps not surprisingly, this fringe segment of society, with its disdain for Bakufu rule, seems to have been one of the main sources that Godaigo drew on in his search for allies. Masashige was supported in his uprising by Godaigo's son, Prince Moriyoshi, who began firing off princely decrees for the destruction of the Hojo one after another, and utilizing his connections with the country's great temples to recruit large numbers of warrior monks to aid in his father's cause. In response to Prince Moriyoshi's decrees, more powerful warriors, Gokenin and otherwise, began rising up across the country, and before they knew it, the Bakufu had a nationwide rebellion on their hands. At the beginning of 1333, the exiled Godaigo escaped from the island of Oki and entered into the protection of an influential Akto warrior in Hoki province, from where he issued his own official decree calling for the elimination of the Hojo. To deal with the rapidly worsening situation, the Bakufu once again dispatched a massive army down into central Japan to put down the insurgency, this one under the command of two of its most exalted members, one a Hojo extended family member and the other a man named Ashikaga Takauji. The Ashikaga family boasted an extremely noble bloodline among the top Gokenin families of the Kamakura Bakufu their founder's mother being Minamoto no Yoritomo's cousin, and their patriarchs having spent generations wedding the daughters of the mainline Hojo family. While their members had never held any of the Bakufu's top administrative positions, they possessed the Shugo offices for two different provinces and held large swathes of territory spread out throughout Japan, meaning that their economic status was no less impressive than their lineage. 
The Bakufu army under Takauji and his co-commander reached central Japan and initially cooperated with allied forces in engaging Godaigo sympathizers in the provinces west of the capital. But when Takauji's co-commander was killed in battle and he was left as the sole commander of the army, he did the unthinkable and switched his allegiance to the side of the deposed emperor. The betrayal was a crushing blow to the Hojo, as Takauji's high status both within the Bakufu and within warrior society in general thanks to his Minamoto blood proved to be all the excuse needed for droves of disgruntled Gokenin to begin abandoning the Hojo and siding with pro-Godaigo forces. We cannot be certain exactly why Takauji did what he did, but it seems likely that it was a decision driven by ambition and pride in his own bloodline and most scholars are in agreement that he had been intending to turn on the Bakufu pretty much from the outset. Takauji threw the might of his army behind the pro-Godaigo warriors who had for some time now been attempting to capture Kyoto from the forces of the Rokuhara Tandai, and together they managed to overrun their foes and seize the city. The Bakufu survivors attempted to flee to Kanto with the new emperor, Emperor Kogon, and two of his retired predecessors, but their path was quickly cut off by more enemies less than 100 kilometers from the capital and all 432 of them ultimately chose to fall on their swords en masse as the bewildered royals looked on. The day after the seizure of the capital, another prominent Gokenin boasting a Minamoto lineage, a man named Nitta Yoshisada, raised troops back in Kanto and began bringing the battle to Bakufu loyalists on their own home turf. Within just a couple of days, he had beaten the Bakufu in several key engagements, and on May 21st, 1333, he took advantage of a low tide to storm into the city of Kamakura itself via a normally unusable coastal route. The fighting inside the city was fierce, with the Hojo and their Miyuchibito retainers struggling desperately to hold the city which had been their capital and home for the last hundred plus years, but after a day of bloody urban combat, it at last became clear that the anti-Bakufu forces had won the day. Hojo Takatoki and his family members and closest associates had gathered in the temple of Toshoji on the northeast side of the city, and when they realized that all hope was lost, they set fire to the temple and began taking their own lives one after another as the flames engulfed the building around them. Japan's first warrior government, the Kamakura Bakufu, had officially gone up in smoke. Or at least that's how it seemed on the surface. On the ground level, however, the only thing that had really been destroyed was the Hojo clan itself, as well as their own personal vassals. The majority of the Kamakura Bakufu's Gokenin constituents had ended up abandoning the Hojo over the course of the conflict, and had thus survived relatively unscathed, meaning that, foreshadowing alert, the Bakufu's base framework was still largely intact. All it would really take to get the whole thing up and running again was a popular new leader to step in and take over where the Hojo had left off but we are getting a bit ahead of ourselves. With the conflict's end, Godaigo returned triumphantly to Kyoto, where he nullified the new Emperor Kogon's status as sovereign and declared that he himself was still the sitting emperor of the country. He also fired Kogon's Kampaku regent and afterward left the post vacant, broadcasting his intention to move forward with the independent emperor-centric style of governance that he had always idolized. The era name was officially changed to Kenmu to mark the occasion, that name being taken from an episode in Chinese history when one of the Han emperors overthrew a usurper and retook the imperial throne, a not so subtle reference to Godaigo's reclamation of power from the upjumped Hojo. Godaigo's advisors, however, apparently opposed the name choice because they thought that the presence of the Mu character, which had strong martial connotations, was highly inauspicious and liable to jinx Godaigo's reign and plague it with military strife. If only they could have known how spot on that prediction would be. But that is a tale best left for next time. And with that, my friends, we have reached the end of our journey through the Kamakura period. With the exception of the Mongol invasions, my personal impression is that this is one of the more glossed over periods of Japanese history, so I hope you've found these last few videos enlightening. I've certainly enjoyed all of the studying I've gotten to do over the course of making them. Speaking of the Mongol invasions, I'm sure some people out there were hoping I'd cover them in a bit more depth here, but they only take up about two pages in a typical Japanese high school history textbook, so I didn't want to stray too far from the standard curriculum. I do also want to potentially leave the door open for a Mongol invasion deep dive video sometime in the future. 
Anyway, from our next episode, we will take our first steps into the Muromachi period, beginning with a subcategory of that period called the Nambukcho, or Northern and Southern Courts period, a phase of history whose name offers a bit of a spoiler as to how events are going to unfold under Emperor Godaigo's leadership. I'm hoping that we'll also be able to cover the Muromachi Bakuhu's golden age which follows that period, but as usual I am predominantly flying by the seat of my pants here, so we'll just have to see how things turn out during script writing. Stay tuned to the end here for a Japanese mnemonic for remembering the year in which the Kamakura Bakuhu fell. And as always, thanks for watching, have a great day, and… Oh, and Happy New Year too.